this is not about a campaign against multinationals just blankly. We would like to see clean businesses who come here pay their taxes when they work with us. The idea of reporting all their profit in a small headquarters where there are only two or three people working there and overlooking the entire operation, which is 60-70% of it is happening in this continent, we would like that to stop. Uh, curtail abusive transfer pricing, for example, trade misinvoicing, for example. There's a lot of work that remains to be done. We must indeed achieve the objective of stopping the bleeding, of retaining these resources on the continent, which are illicitly flowing out of the continent. These scenes are not so dissimilar to one that happens every day across the African continent. A businessman goes into a bank and makes a transfer of funds to an offshore company. Little questions are asked and millions are funneled out of the country electronically in a matter of minutes to a territory where little or no tax is accrued. This scenario is also surprisingly legal. A senior government minister collaborates with a mineral company executive to stash money and profits earned illegally in a foreign bank. A woman gives $5,000 to a man in the hopes to get her whole family across the border illegally. This is a human trafficker. He deposits the money in an overseas bank where it is cleaned and legitimized. All these are examples of illicit financial flows or IFFs. Money leaving the continent, being funneled into international, global, already developed capitals and depriving African national economies of vital liquidity and resources. The campaign to stem IFFs, or previously termed capital flight, is by no means a new phenomenon and has recently received a boost by the revelation of the Panama Papers, an unprecedented leak of over 11 million files detailing wealthy individuals and numerous multinationals exploiting secretive offshore tax regimes has elevated the issues of illicit flows to the forefront of the global agenda and media scrutiny. The establishment of the high-level panel represented a watershed and new strategy to combat the illicit flows. All started in, uh, on a Sunday in Malawi. We were preparing for the opening of the African Ministers of Finance, Planning and Economic Development Conference in 2010. The room was full. We were really surprised with the response. And those who attended, they said, no, this has to go to the ministerial proper the following day. And we had a two hours discussion on it. And African Ministers of Finance, in their wisdom, they said, no, this is a development issue that is too important for the continent. We cannot allow this continent, the poor part of the world, to subsidize the rich part. I sometimes refer to it as, as being like a hydra with many heads. And a strange hydra, when you cut some heads, by the time you get to the seventh head, the first one has regrown. It's so dynamic, it keeps on changing shape uh, uh, and form. So we have to be resolved to the fact that we will always be chasing finding out new ways of uh, illicit financial flow and trying to deal with them. That, that, that's the first thing. GFI analyzes illicit financial flows, not only out of Africa, but out of other parts of the world as well. Um, we did a study of illicit money going out of Africa. We were asked by UNECA to come and discuss it. We did so. This is going back five or six years uh, now. Um, UNECA was frankly fascinated with uh, our analysis that the commercial component of illicit financial flows is bigger than the corrupt component of illicit financial flows because quite honestly the media had been uh, uh, for years enjoying uh, its criticism of Africa for uh, uh, the amount of corrupt money that is going out. So, we came along and, and said, yes, corruption's a problem, but uh, the biggest part of this is commercial. According to GFI, these are the three clear definitions of IFF as seen before earlier. Corruption, criminal, and the commercial aspect. The estimated 50 to 80 billion US dollars that the African continent loses annually in illicit flows is about double that what the continent receives in ODA, or official development assistance. 
Moreover, based on the methodology of the Economic Commission for Africa, abusive transfer pricing and misinvoicing, the underreporting of amounts produced and profits made are another major source of commercial illicit funds lost forever. When we then presented our report to the African heads of state and government, they adopted the report in full, uh, adopted the recommendations that we had made, and, and then decided as African heads of state and government to follow up on the implementation of what had been the recommendations which had then been adopted as decisions of, of the AU summit. There has been a, a confluence of forces that have really given this a boost and also, as you know very well, the, the birth of this was looking for how the continent can finance itself. And one of the uh, immediate low-hanging fruits was the issue of illicit financial flows out of Africa. So I think uh, it's firstly therefore leadership, secondly uh, circumstance, and thirdly the strategy brought to this by the ECA. So it's been a, an exciting work and the whole purpose is to promote African development. And how do you promote it? There has to be resources. It's resource mobilization. And in that regard, what are the obstacles to resource mobilization? And one of the obstacles is illicit financial flows from the continent. There is really nowhere else on the continent where there is a plug-in for policy and legislative shifts that we need to make on the continent to defend our outflows other than currently the high-level panel. And they're doing a tremendous job because they've gone from beyond the report and letting it gather dust in somebody's office, but also looking at the systemic work that needs to be done, work with regards to policy and policy shifts, both at the ministerial, ministry of finance level, as well as bringing in civil society and regional organizations to make the necessary policy shifts that we require. It's good work that they do. Even before the Panama Papers, they have managed to elevate the issue of uh, international financial flows, at least, or illicit financial flows from, from Africa, at least, into an international issue. It's a global challenge also. So they, in some, they anticipated the Panama Papers, perhaps they'll be similar in future, but already the work of the panel has already put this into the fore, has already elevated this into a global issue, a global challenge, something requiring global action. Illicit flows have steadily increased over the years in scale and magnitude and fundamentally undermine our ability on the continent to achieve our sustainable development goals, impede transparency and risk further increasing inequality and poverty. The campaign to stem IFFs is now galvanised under a wider context, incorporating an array of actors from civil society, tax and governance advocates and government and parliamentarians. We wanted it on the global agenda. It is now on the global agenda. So there are many people who are part of this campaign to, to stop the continent bleeding of these resources. So it's governments, it's civil society, it's business, it's everybody. Our role we see as bringing the interests of citizens on the table to ensure that the design of, of policies that will ultimately curtail uh, illicit financial flows and ensure domestic resocialization are policies that are not also at the same time uh, leading to increased inequality and having a situation where it's already the, the poor that, that are already carrying the burden that are going to suffer out of that. And that, for that to happen, you need to have uh, civil society organizations in the room to create that critical mass uh, of, of actors to be able to, to again, um, demand that the, 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 the politicians and the governments actually fulfill their commitments, honor their commitments in terms of what they are said they, they are planning to do to, to curb illicit financial flows. Firstly, do you even know that there's IFFs? And if you do, what does that mean to you as a political party? Uh, in election campaigns, in parties that are in parliament, because we, don't, we just say MPs, some come from ruling parties, some from opposition. Those that are in ruling parties, 
how are you influencing your own ruling party in, ter in terms of IFF? But more so, because parliamentarians get a budget for constituencies, are you taking this as an issue at constituency level, where you are saying in terms of mobilization, how do I take this message and explain it to an ordinary African? I mean, Panama Papers came for Africa, we say they came, they are gone. For most African communities, it just, it has meant nothing. People don't even know what that is. So we are saying at APNIF, it is your role as an MP to take this message to that lower level because these are the people that vote and keep governments afloat. If they are not empowered to know what is going on, they are never going to hold governments accountable. Accountability is also in need of another key building block to fight illicit flows, capacity. Capacity building of appropriate institutions across the continent is key to improving skills and enforcing financial retention. We begin to see that uh, capacity challenges or the lack of capacity is a critical issue for combating illicit financial flows and stop, stopping the bleeding. In particular, one area where African countries have big problem is actually implementing the legislations and the laws that they have for, you know, for money laundering and for corruption and for uh, all kinds of activities, illegal uh, outflow of funds. And so we're working very hard to strengthen these institutions so that they can become more effective in uh, you know, dealing with these issues and they become better coordinated in terms of what they do. A clear metric on the success of tracking illicit flows is also its subsequent retrieval. Headway has now been made in a number of countries, generating repatriation of funds and the curtailment of aggressive tax avoidance regimes. But we need even improvements to track it better. You know, better accounting and international accounting standards, better capacity with customs officials, better capacity uh, in drawing agreements and, and other things. I mean, even just identifying or tracking uh, will take some effort. Uganda recently won an international court case against a British oil company. And as a result of that case, gathered 423 million US dollars in income that they would have lost did they not have a capital gains tax policy and law in Uganda. Many African countries do not have that. And because Uganda had that law, they were able to go to international arbitration, win the case and now have that income. The cumulative effect of strengthening financial architecture, challenging banking secrecy, and reforming common tax orthodoxy reduces outflows and critically increases income on the continent. As the fight to stem illicit flows continues, the policy and legislative shifts being implemented by the panel will inevitably need to adapt to future innovative and more clandestine methods of outflows, preempting a drive to shift not only the legal structures but also an overall moral offensive on IFFs and their consequences. You know for a fact that basically everybody in the world is going to disapprove. It might be legal, but if it's immoral, uh, and they, people understand what that immorality means in practical terms. But secondly, I think the, uh, there's much greater commitment among governments throughout the world, that the, where legislation doesn't exist, it must be passed. Where it exists, it must be enforced. That you need all of these uh, agreements and benchmarks, standards and all that, uh, to ensure that uh, you, you can you have both, both uh, you can have moral motivation, please act correctly, but you must also have the law on your side to say those who don't act correctly, then the law can act against them. So that you see even the definition of what's illicit in terms of the law, as people understand the loopholes and so on, and, uh, and the impact, the negative impact of these illicit uh, flows in terms of the quality of the lives of, of many, many people.